Amen. Thank you very much. That was great, Stephanie. Stephanie said I would like that. It was because of the wood block, right? <laughs> the wood block is the one instrument that I'm pretty convinced I could actually play. <laughs> that was great. Hey, let's grab our Bibles and turn to James chapter 4. We're going to dismiss children for Children's Church at this time. If you are a child, you are free to go, free also to stay for a good sermon. If you'd like, parents, it's up to you either way. Also, at this time, our Spanish-speaking ministry will be dismissed. They meet over in this corner here, my right, your left. So if you speak Spanish or know somebody who does, love to invite you for our Spanish Bible study. James chapter 4 is the text. When we find that, let us stand up together as we are standing in acknowledgments that God's word is holy, it is infallible, it is inerrant, and it is the authority over our lives. When we read it, we are listening to the very words of God. James chapter 4, verse 13, short paragraph. Let's listen. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, We'll go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Let's pray. Lord, we don't want to sin against you. We love you. And you love us. And you tell us in this passage that that our lives are so short and brief and they're like a mist or a vapor which is here today and gone tomorrow. And God, I... I speak for myself, but for everybody in the room, I would imagine when I say we don't want to waste our lives, we want to use them to glorify you and to love our families and to build your church. So Father, as we talk about time today, would you please help us to use this time, this moment, this present to glorify and honor you as we give attention to your holy word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I've been thinking a lot about time lately. I've been thinking a lot about time. In fact, this summer I'm just kind of using these sermons before we start another series to uh, share some things that I've been thinking about for a long time, just haven't had an opportunity to preach on it. And so I was, I've been thinking about time a lot lately, and I thought I want to preach a sermon on time. And time has captivated me for a while. I suppose it's because uh, time is almost Trinitarian in the sense that uh, there's one thing concept called time and yet it's tripartite there's past present future you know that same thing with space by the way which is also interesting that space in itself three dimensions height length depth and so the two the two things that comprise a reality both time and space are both trinitarian i find that interesting i'm not sure that god did that on purpose to point us to the trinity maybe he did i don't know I know that there's no good analogy for the Trinity in that sense, that nothing can actually uh, diagram what God is like in his nature. But time is interesting in that it is, it is somewhat Trinitarian, the three parts of time. And it's, it's scientific, it's precise. We measure things in units and in increments of time. Uh, we mark our days, our calendars by months and weeks and in years, and time can be very precise. We can think of, for instance, like in the Olympics, have you ever seen the track and field athletes when they compete in a race, and the difference between first place and eighth place is a fraction of a second, or sometimes in the Olympic swimming events, the two swimmers come to the edge of the pool, and they, and they touch it, and the, the clock stops, and the, the, the difference between first and second place is just a fraction of a second. And it's so precise, and we use time to set our schedules and our meetings and expectations for other people in our lives. And there's a sense in which time is, is a very precise unit of measurement. And yet at the same time, here's the irony here, time is also a bit of a mystery. It's a paradox. It's, it's a philosophical concept. It's something theological. And I think that's what has really got me thinking today. I want you to picture, if you will, picture, do this. Picture for me an hourglass. Can you see it in your mind's eye, a big hourglass right in front of, it, in front of us? And what do you have with an hourglass? You have three things happening. On the bottom, of course, 
You have the sand that's already fallen. Let's call that the past. It's done. It's gone. Never goes back up to the top container again. Never has the opportunity to fall through the middle. It's, it's down. It's on the bottom. That's the past. And then in the middle, the very middle of the hourglass, you've got what we might call the present, the, the very grains of sand that are falling now and now. And there's another one. And then at the top, of the hourglass is that container of that which has yet to fall and we can think of that as the future if you will. Let me just let me just talk about each one of those three just for a second. The past, time. You'd almost think that the past is eternal, wouldn't you? That it goes on and on forever and ever. In fact, some scientists and even some philosophers say that the past is eternal. Let's, Let's point in this direction today and call that the past. Some people would say that the past is infinite or it's eternal. It goes on forever and ever. I don't believe that myself and I'll tell you why. Because if the past was infinite, there would never be a way that we could get to the very moment that we're in right now. If it was a whole series of dominoes and we're looking at this domino falling, one of them has to start, right? I think the Bible actually teaches that the past, while it's massive and it's huge, going back eons and millennia, is probably finite. There was a beginning, and that's the beginning of the book of Genesis. In the beginning was what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so there must have been a beginning to time. The past is gone. We can't relive it. What's happened is done. There's nothing you can do to change it. Uh, There's a sense in which we can study the things of the past. If something endures into the present, maybe a bone fragment or a piece of pottery, or a photograph, or a memory, and the synapses of your brain, it pervades into the present. But basically what's come and gone is, is beyond us, and there's not much that we can do to, to change it. Of course, Genesis also tells us that we mark time by the rotations of the heavenly bodies. Then the fourth day, God created the sun, the moon, the stars. And for the most part, we use those things to mark our days. One revolution of the earth, we call a day. One cycle around the sun, we call it a year. The moon goes around the earth once, we call it a month. And for the most part, we mark our time by these movements of the heavenly bodies. So the past, there it is, huge, but not infinite. Then you have the present. Think about this. The present is so small. It is just a fragment. The present is just an instant. If you think about it, we talk about sometimes like a year, like 2018 is the present, but that's not really the present. The present is much smaller than a year. It's August. 12th of a year or the 12th of August, one day in a year. But even now, even now, these moments are so short. They're, they're brief. They're finite. It's one grain of sand. It's a razor's edge. It's a, the breadth of a hair. That's all the present is. It's here for a second and then it's gone. And then there's the future. Let's look this way. As far as I know, the future is infinite unlike the past it's massive like the past is much bigger than the present of course but the future is probably infinite as far as we know time is going to go on forever and ever and ever there's a little passage in revelation 22 where it talks about the tree of life bearing fruit month after month and every month it bears fruit as far as i know the future is going to go on eternally forever and ever and so what i want to do obviously obviously is we want to talk about time this morning and how that affects our lives. I want to think about it deeply. I want to think about our past, our present, our future. And so if you closed your Bible, would you please fix that this morning? I'd like, it'd be my preference if you always had your own Bible out on your lap with you this morning. What I'm going to do this morning is uh, very, uh, very often I will give three points to a sermon or something like that. And I'll, I'll kind of make a big deal about them and, and tell you what the main points are. Today I'm just going to work through the passage, all right? Uh, You can pick the main points. Whatever you think is important, those will be the main points for you. But as for me, all I'm going to do is work through this paragraph line by line and just think about everything that James says in this passage. All of it's about time, and I want you to just think about your life. Think about your past, your present, your future. Let's get into it. Let's start in verse 13. Come now, he says, you who say today or tomorrow... We'll go into such and such a town and we'll spend a year there. There's a time marker, right? I saw a couple of them already. The word today is a time marker, so is the word tomorrow. We'll spend a year there and what? We'll trade and we'll make a profit. Pause right there. Now, if you've read the book of James at all, 
you probably know that James has this thing against arrogant people constantly throughout the five chapters of James. James is confronting arrogance in all of its forms. And here, what James is going to do in this verse is he's confronting a certain kind of arrogance. He's confronting a certain kind of arrogance about people who believe that they actually can control time, their lives. I've got this under control. I'm going to go here. I'm going to spend a year. I'm going to go there. I'm going to go to that city. I'm going to make a profit. We're going to get out of it, coming up shiny like a penny. That's what these people are saying, and James has a problem with that. And James has a problem with those who think that they control their lives, their own future. Is your own future really in your own hands? Is it? You got it all under control? You got your life planned out, do you? James says, hold up, be careful. Now somebody might say, and I think this is a fairly good objection, you know, what's James got against planning? I don't think James has anything with against planning. Good planning is fine. Good planning is important. Go back and read the book of Proverbs. There's a whole lot of things that the Bible says about planning, thinking through, making strategies. Nothing wrong with that. I don't think that's the problem at all. I think what James has a problem though here is those who think they actually control the time of their lives. You don't control the time of your life, do you? No, of course not. You don't have any more control over your future than you do the weather or the storms or the lightning in the sky. Now there is a sense in which, don't get me wrong, there is a sense in which we can use time to our benefit. We call that time management. There you go. And more than not, people who manage time effectively are successful people. If you are one of those people who has the ability, not everybody does, to set your alarm and get up and go to work every day. Well, good on you. You probably have a greater chance of being successful in your chosen career field than people who can't do that simple task. Yeah? If you're a student, some of you are starting school tomorrow as a teacher or, or as, a, as a student in a class, a new grade, you're going to a new university perhaps. I will tell you this. If you are among those students who has the ability to actually plan out your assignments and write your papers and turn them in on time, you're probably going to be far more successful than people who can't. That's just the deal. That's called time management. We've all seen people in our lives, whether they're homeschool mothers or uh, whether they're business professionals, and they seem to be able to manage time fairly effectively. I have to be to a meeting in Tampa, okay? Well, these people seem to have the ability to think about things like the traffic and whatnot, and they make careful strategizing as to how long it's going to take to get there. And they're very effective. And some people who can use time to their benefit can be very successful in life. But hold up a second, because just as I'm saying that, you have to realize, of course, that nobody can actually control time. Can you? No way. That's what James has a problem with. Those who think that they own the future, those who think that they're really in control of their lives. If you actually stop to think about it, time is kind of like, kind of like a wild Mustang that nobody can saddle and control. Now you can't, I can't. Can't push pause. Can't rewind. Wouldn't there be moments where you would love to be able to rewind and relive it again? Wouldn't you want that? I think about the moment that my wife burst into the back doors of the church and I was standing next to a pastor and she walked forward to me in that beautiful white dress on our, on our wedding day and I say to myself, I would just, I would kill to be able to see that again. Wouldn't you? Be able to pause, to be able to rewind, to be able to skip over things that you don't want to endure anymore. Maybe there's a difficult situation in your life. You want to skip past, I want to fast forward through that. Guess what? Nobody can do it. Can't control time. And every time we try to take something like that, that's not in our possession, and try to control it, James says, don't go there. Matter of fact, let's, uh, let's flip back, if you will, to Luke chapter 12. I want to show you a guy, by way of example, who thought he could control the future. James, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 is the passage. Luke 12, 13, it's a parable that Jesus teaches about greed, as a matter of fact. Two kinds of greed, though, in this passage. There's the material greed of life, and then there's the greed of the control of time. You're going to notice the same theme. It's almost like James is thinking about this parable from Luke. 
Look at this. Luke chapter 12, let's dig in at verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Verse 14. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. All right, very well. Now Jesus tells a story, verse 16, to illustrate his point. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? Wow, look at this. Fancy you. Verse 18, And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I'll store my grain and my goods, and I'll say to my soul, Soul? You have ample goods. Good on you. Well done. Nice for you. Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. There it is. Time marker. Relax. Eat. Drink. And be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This night. Time marker. Your soul is required of you and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Every time we think we control the future, every time we've got, every time we think we've got an angle on our own future or the future of somebody else, it seems like the Lord steps in and says, uh, no, only I control time. Only I control time. Now let's flip back to the book of James where we're doing a little bit of work this morning here. We looked at verse 13 already. And then James asks a question. Look at this. He says, Yet you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? What is your life? Question. You should think about that for a second. Have you done that yet? Have you ever you ever thought about meaningfully what, like, what is your life? What is your purpose? What's your, why are you here? What are you trying to accomplish? What are your goals? Give me a metaphor for what your life is like. Some of you would come up with all kinds of different metaphors. James says, think of one. All right? <laughs> Some of you, maybe your life is like a zoo. Can anybody relate to that? If you're a school teacher tomorrow, you will probably think your life is a zoo or a circus maybe, I don't know. Some of you, you look at your life and you're like, I'm a dumpster fire. Anybody? <laughs> Just everything's a mess. Everything is out of control. My life is a dumpster fire. I've made a wreck of all the relationships in my life that are meaningful. I am just struggling today, Pastor Matt. Others of you, maybe you're like a, cr a cross stitch. You know, you look really nice on top. You got it all figured out at least to show other people. At least your public self is all nice and stitched and tidy up here. But what happens when you flip over a cross stitch, right? What's on the other side? Tangled mess. And you know, you know that you're trying to look good on the outside, but underneath there's just all this wreckage happening. It's all just chaos under there, and you're trying to carry that out as though that's you. James says, you give me a metaphor. All right, I got one for you. What does he say? Here you are. You're a mist. You like that? A mist? Like I was hoping for something a little bit more impressive. I want to be a, a diamond. I want to be a snowflake. Tell me I'm tell me I'm one of a kind. Tell me there's nobody else out there like me. Tell me I'm a I'm a king or a queen. And and I don't listen, I don't mean to denigrate anybody here. The Bible does say some fantastic things about who we are in relation to our Father in heaven. In relation to our Father in heaven, we are his children, we are his priests, we are his kingdom. I'm not putting any of that aside this morning, but we're talking about time. And James says, if you want to reckon yourself in comparison to time, here's a thought. You're a mist, a vapor. You're here for moments and then you are gone. No longevity, no breath, no substantiality. We live 
for a very brief time and then, and then we die. I had an opportunity while I was in Ohio to go see the grave of A.W. Tozer, famous pastor, a theologian from Akron, Ohio. He's actually born in a, I'm sorry, he's buried in a cemetery that's not too far from Kelly's parents' house. And so whenever we go over to, to my in-laws, I like to go to see where A.W. Tozer is buried. It's a very simple grave marker. It just says his name and the dates and then it says a man of God. That's all. That's all there is to it. There's not much more to see than that. Just his name and a date and a man of God. And every time I go to that little grave marker, I think to myself, you know, that's what I want for my life. I want to be considered a man of God. But, but it's just a stone. It's just a stone. And I think, well, that's permanent. It's not going anywhere. And then I, then I walked through some of the other tombs and I realized that even some of the best stones, even some of the greatest stones, they're so weather-worn. They're so worn out from season after season of Ohio rains and winters that you can't even read the names on the stones anymore. Even if you wanted to find the date of a particular person, it might be hard to find because they're just worn out. And I'm thinking to myself, here's A.W. Tozer's gravestone. One day his name's not even going to be recognizable anymore. The date... The man of God bit, pretty cool, right? For a while. And so here's this other property of time that I wanted to tell you a little bit about this morning. I, I made this up. It's called relative elasticity. Write that down. Sounds really good, doesn't it? I made that up. Relative elasticity. What do you mean by that, Pastor Matt? Well, Time has this way about it of seeming to go faster or slower based on your perspective, thus the relative part. And sometimes it seems like it's going really fast, like when you're having a really good time, and sometimes it thinks, you know, it feels like it's going really slow if you're not having such a good time, and so there's the elasticity part. If you think about it, time has a way of moving in different shapes. Like if you're five years old and you're coming up on your birthday, doesn't a year seem like it's forever Remember that? Remember when you were five and you wanted your birthday and it was a year away? And when you're 85, I don't know, some of you do, maybe, I don't know, uh, doesn't a year seem like it just goes by like the snap of a finger? Yeah? Relative elasticity. If I'm holding a plank position, anybody work out? Doesn't, a, doesn't 60 seconds seem like forever to hold a plank? But if you're, if you're hugging your mom goodbye at the airport and you're not going to see her for a while, 60 seconds is like, it's not enough. And the, here's the deal, that all of our lives, by the time we actually come to the end of it, relative elasticity, we'll look back on it and we'll say, where did it go? It's, it's so brief and so here we are we're finite beings we're we're small we're not infinite like God we're finite or we're going to die one day it boggles my mind to even think about that but my life is going to come to a conclusion at some point whether I'm expecting it or not I'm a finite being I can only be in one place at one time I wish I could be multiple places can't do it neither can you Wish I could think a whole bunch of thoughts. I wish I'd accomplish a lot of things in my life. Sometimes I look at other pastors or theologians or writers and I say to myself, my goodness, how do they do it? How are they so productive? Here's, here's, here's the big idea. So if life is so short, we better get to the important stuff. Like what's with wasting time then if my life is going to be brief and I want to get about the important stuff in life. I want to be about God and family and my church and not a whole lot else because everything else is probably going to distract me. And I don't want grains of sand dripping through my life going into the past with nothing to show for it. I'm afraid of that. I think that's kind of the point of the mist analogy and then James goes on and he says what are you what, what's your life you're a mist that appears for a little while and vanishes instead you ought to say if the Lord wills we will live and do this or that okay so verse 15 look at the word instead instead of what well instead of the attitude back in verse 13 where the guy thought he could control his life instead here's a different way of looking at your life rather than controlling your own future even your own present the person who says instead says rather if the Lord wills we will live and do this or that don't even get past the, the phrase uh, live because I'm not even sure we're going to make it through the service today to be honest right we think we know it's 
11, 33. I think we all know where we're probably going to be at 12, right? Heading out the doors. Do we really know that, though? Really don't know. And so basically, it, you know, it seems like we all control our time, our days. I can spend my whole day tomorrow. I'm off. Monday's my day off. I can watch Netflix all day if I want to. It auto plays the next episode, so it wouldn't even be very hard. I could do that. Or I could write a card to a widow in the church. Or I could visit a widow in the church. And so I determine in some respects my days, but here's, here's the deal. The overall arch of my life is only controlled by God, not me. And so here's another property of time I just want to throw out for you while we're thinking about it, while we're doing big brain work on the concept of time this morning. Let's call this, I made this up, the equality, inequality principle of time. What do you got, what do you got here, Pastor Matt? Think about this. In one sense, every single one of us has exactly the same time, don't we? That's the equality part. How many hours a day do you get? What? 24. You know anybody that's got 36? You know anybody that's got 20? No. Every person who's ever lived, including Jesus, by the way, in his incarnate state had 24 hours a day we all get seven days a week nobody gets more than that nobody gets less than that and yet we look at certain people and we say to ourselves like how do they do it how do they manage I look at a guy like C.S. Lewis for instance and he wrote all of these books and I think to myself how in the world does he have such a such a mental capacity and a dedication to be able to write all these things and and then there's like Steve Jobs he wasn't a Christian as far as I know but man what a life what a life setting up Apple and all the things that they did with that technology firm. And you look at these successful people, maybe a homeschool mom again, just by way of example, and she cooks and she cleans and she teaches and she preps and, and she's got the yard looking nice and she does devotions with her family and has two hours of quiet time in the morning before the kids wake up and you say to yourself, how in the world? How many hours does she get? How many does she get? 24, just like you. That's the equality part, but here's the inequality part is contrary to that, we actually don't know how long our lives are going to be. Methuselah from the Old Testament, trivia question. He's the oldest man recorded in Scripture. How many years did he get? I knew you'd know that, Alan. 969 years. Jesus had 33 the son of David with Bathsheba, seven days. Doesn't seem fair. Some people get a lot of time, some people get a little, and we don't get to determine that. Who determines that? Only God. Psalm 139. Psalm 139, let me read you this verse. I don't want to mess this up. I want to quote it exactly. Psalm 139 says, Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was not one of them. So there's God, sovereign over all time, even when I'm in the womb, it's a little, little embryo, a little fetus forming and planting on my mom's uterine wall, and yet God knows all the days of my life. He's got them written out in a book such that he knows the beginning from the end, and I can't even see to the end of the service. And so time is kind of significant, isn't it? Let's go on to verse 16 and 17, and then we're going to finish up here with a couple of applications. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So James, once again, he confronts those who are arrogant enough to think that they control their own lives. Yes, there's a sense in which we influence our own trajectory. We make real choices. We make real decisions every single day. But God is the one who controls the overarching theme, the trajectory, the balance of our lives. It's all in his hands. So, here we go. We're going to close it up. So, whenever you see the word so, that means that probably the big E on the I chart is coming, okay? The big application part, the therefore, if you will, in the, in the paragraph. So, verse 17, whoever knows the right thing to do and yet fails to do it, for him 
it is sin. And James ends this chapter on kind of a dagger to the heart, don't you think? <laughs> it is for me. Like I read this line and I'm like, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Boom, that one hurt. Let me make a couple of applications for you before we wrap up today. Since we're doing time, let me make one from each of the three categories of time. First of all, application to your past. Can't change it. We know that. There's a sense in which we would all probably wish we could rewind things of our lives and, and do them over again. When I was a kid, we used to play kickball out on the street. We used to have a rule. If you're in the middle of a play and a car comes down, we called it a do-over. Turns out when you grow up, life gets a little bit more complicated and there are no do-overs. And some of the mistakes that we've made in the past are still haunting us to this day. Some of the things that we've said that have cut down other people, cut down ourselves, maybe decisions we made when we were late teenagers, even early 20s. Some of those decisions that we made back then in our past have influenced us and some of them even haunt us to this day. We wish we could do anything to be re able to rewind the past and redo those particular moments. And yet here's the deal. Nobody gets that opportunity. Nobody. Grain falls through the hourglass to the bottom. Done. Can't change it. It's past. But what you can do is have your past forgiven and wiped away with the gospel. Isn't it interesting that Christ in his incarnational ministry came and he entered into time, didn't he? He entered into time, not just theoretically, but actually lived on planet Earth for a particular period of years. We call it somewhere around, I don't know, A.D., well, zero, probably he was born a little bit before that, died around 33 AD, something to that effect, 33 years of life, give or take a little bit, and yet he did some things in the past, in the past, that matter significantly and eternally. Some of the things that Jesus did in the past don't need to be wiped away and don't need to be relived because their efficacy, their effectiveness actually matters for us in our present today. His death, his resurrection, these are things that took place in the past, in history, and they matter eternally. His death, 33 AD, an event in the past, foreseen by the Father from all eternity when it was just the three persons of the Trinity in perfect harmony. Before God even created time, God had a plan that on a particular day, Jesus would die on the cross. For some, it was in the future from their perspective. For some, it was in the present. For us, it's in the past. That single event in the past matters for eternity. And because of that, all of the sins of your past, all of the mistakes that you've made in the past can be wiped away and your record can be made brand new. Praise be to God that he restores and corrects and wipes away our past. Amen? Amen. Application to the present. What is the present? Well, I already told you that it's the smallest of all units of time. It's a razor's edge. It's as wide as a hair. It's one grain going through the hourglass. And so some respects, the present is the most precious of the three increments of time. Wouldn't you agree? Most precious? Where does our consciousness take place in? The present. The very instant that we're living in right now, that's the moment that we call the present. And yes, five seconds ago is now in the past, and five seconds yet to come is the future. But right now is the present. You only get one present. Anthony on staff, he said something really brilliant this week at the staff meeting. I don't know if he, where he got this from, a fortune cookie or something like this. But Anthony said, uh, he said that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. And the second best time is right now. Yeah. The present. Here you are, sitting in church. And don't you, like me, don't you want this one grain of sand this moment for every moment of the rest of your life to glorify God so that you can enjoy him forever? Don't you want to give him this little grain of sand? We're just going to live a few more years. We're a breath, we're a vapor, we're a mist, but don't you just cry out, God, use me in my time and age. Don't you want that? 
Don't you, want, don't you want your life to be given over to him? And don't you want your marriage to be strong? And don't you want your children to know Jesus? Don't you want so badly for this present life, the only life that you get to matter for eternity, don't you? Yes, and so do I. And so let, let's think then, final application about the future. Picture the person you want to be one day. Like we're not dead yet, for goodness sakes, we're alive. We're not A.W. Tozer in a grave. We're here right now. Praise God. We still have life. We still have the vapor. The mist is still here. Breath in my lungs. But there's a person that I want to be in the future. There's a kind of person that I'm hoping that God is going to shape me into being. I want to be a better pastor. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father. I want to be the kind of dad that prays with my children at the dinner table. I want to be the kind of husband that loves my wife even through the tough times. I want to be the kind of dad that brings my kids to Sunday school and sets my alarm and gets up. There's a kind of person that I want to be in the future when I die. And so the only way for me to shape that is what? Become it today. Become it today. And so if you're sitting here listening and all this has been nonsense, philosophy, for you, that's totally fine, but I'm sure that there's maybe somebody here today that is saying, you know what, I want that life change. I want to become a kind of person whose life is devoted over to the glory of God. I want the one grain of sand that I am to matter for his glory. If that's you, I'd love to talk to you today after church. Love to pray for you. The elders are going to be available on this side of the sanctuary to pray with you. Deacons will be over available to you over on this side of the sanctuary if you have any material or financial lead, needs. But let's go ahead and stand together. I'm going to pray the benediction upon us. And as we go, let's just let's just think on it. What is your life? What is your life? You're a mist. Me too. God, we want to glorify you. We want to honor you. Lord, there's things that we've done in the past that we've just, oh, if we're honest, we've just messed up and, and we need you to wipe that away. And Lord, in the future, we all have a picture of the kind of person we desire to be one day. And, and we pray that by your spirit and through your grace that you would transform us into those kind of people. But, but Lord, all we have is this very moment itself. And so I'm praying that your spirit would do work. Changing, convicting, strengthening. And for whatever change you bring in our lives, we will give you the praise and the glory. And all God's people said, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you his peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I love you lots. Have a great week.